Okay, thanks very much for that and welcome to this first workshop. We're a bit squeezed on time, I'm afraid, but uh, we'll have to just sort of fit in as we can. I'm Sue Woodward. I'm a member of the opposition at Staffordshire County Council, one of the first opposition groups to join the CCIN. And I'm also leader of Burntwood Town Council, a large parish council in Staffordshire. Um, this year has certainly been a year for cooperation uh, and for communities and uh, you know we want to try and make sure that we capitalise on the goodwill that's been generated over the period of the pandemic. I'll ask those who are presenting the three case studies to give a brief introduction of themselves when they start off but I want to just introduce Rob Gregory, who's facilitating this session. He's the Assistant Director of Communities and Neighbourhoods at Stevenage Borough Council. And my goodness me, communities and neighbourhoods feature very highly in cooperative thinking and certainly have over this pandemic. So um, can I ask that people, if you've got questions, can you put them into the chat? box into the chat function if we don't have time at the end to pick up all of those rob's going to capture them uh, and you'll get um, you'll get answers in writing hopefully um and so on to the three presentations which is the meat you don't want the chair to be talking too much um case study one involves dorden philip uh, village shop and this is North Warwickshire Labour and Cooperative Group who are presenting to us, uh, Councillor Jackie Chambers and Councillor Adam Farrell. So over to you, Jackie and Adam. Sue, uh, thanks very much. You'll notice Jackie's not in the call yet, so I wonder whether we could switch the agenda around just to be a pain, um, because it is Jackie's baby really, and I don't want to take that away from her. Okay, we'll do that. Make sure that everybody's on their toes. Uh, Judy, Councillor Judy Billing, who's a cabinet member in a coalition at North Hertfordshire District Council. Judy, are you able to present your case study to us, please? I will, I will try and prove that actually completely outside of my personality style, I can be flexible. All right, so I've taken a, a big gulp and a deep breath and my heart is palpitating, but I will be flexible. So you Brilliant. want to go now? Yes, please. I'm, I'm here. Sorry, oh. Councillor Woodward, I'm here, just to let you know. Sorry, I'm okay, late. Well, well, shall we just go with Judy first of all? This is case study two. Thanks. Okay. So, um, in my old age, I find that I either have everything to say about something or nothing to say about something. Um, and when I started talking to myself yesterday about exactly what I wanted to say, I discovered I had everything to say. So the chair is going to have to probably be a bit strict with me because there is history to this. And in North Arts District Council, we do actually have a rather proud history of community engagement um, since 1974 nonsense when the council was invented. And many of us found ourselves in places that didn't exist and all the um, uh, rural district councils and the urban district councils were shut down and people woke up in the morning um, to be a res resident of North Hertfordshire, uh, which nobody came from. They came from Hitchin or Letchworth or Bulldog or Royston. And so I have to say that even though for m many of those years the council was not in the control of people with a normal dedication to community engagement, actually, it worked very hard at things like area democracy, area committees, um, the retention of a community engagement team, which um, the, uh, a Labour Council in 1995 to 99, um, when most of the council was, most of the country was Labour controlled, was able to build on. And since um, May 2019, North Hertfordshire has benefited from a hard-working, uh, challenging uh, coalition of, of Labour and Liberal Democrat councillors running the council. And I make that point because actually I have to give credit to history. We could not have achieved what we have achieved in terms of cooperation and community development and engagement had it not been for the basics being there. We wouldn't have been able to afford to start it from scratch. And I think that needs to be said. So in July 2019, that's the end of the history lesson, you'll be glad to know. In July 2019, 
um, conscious of um, threats of universal credit, um, huge uh, spikes in homelessness, austerity, and many other uh, policy issues from government causing tremendous food poverty in this uh, leafiest of, of apparently wealthy places. There were a lot of people and groups wanting to help in North Hertfordshire. There were a lot of people wanting to provide food for people who needed food. But there was also, we suspected, we saw, we found, we felt, um, some competitiveness amongst the different groups who were making this provision, food provision to people. There were groups who had a slight feeling that they were the only people who knew how to talk to people who were homeless. There were people who didn't want to share their information because after all, there are very serious issues of confidentiality. Um, and it was down to the council to develop a spirit of cooperation, which is what this is all about. And in July, 2019, it set up the North Hearts Food Provision Network Group, which is a bit of a poncy title really, for getting together all those people as far as we could in the district who were making food provision, who were looking after people who were, um, who were unemployed, in poverty, homeless, uh, victims of domestic abuse and see if we could get these groups working together in a cooperative spirit. And the community development team, more than the, the, the politicians, I have to say, has worked astonishingly hard. Meetings are held regularly now at North Hearts Council, or the remote version of North Hearts Council as we now know it. Um, there have been several meetings. The group runs every six weeks to two months. People have become less suspicious, less protective um, and very much more cooperative. Um, things that happened before have of course changed enormously and it's interesting to note that we did this work before the pandemic hit us and before lockdown and before COVID-19 changed our lives forever. But what it means is that enormous strides were able to be made very quickly we didn't have to invent things like Zoom, like the rest of us all had to invent in order to be able to feed people in the district. So um, a Best Before Cafe, um, which was already in Letchworth, has managed to massively expand its work, has worked with local supermarkets who have been massively helpful and productive. Um, and I won't bore you with a lot of statistics, but of course, everything that was being done prior to COVID has now um, been, been magnified uh, 10 or 20 times. So we have a Royston Food Bank, a Hitchin Food Provision Team, a Hitchin Food Rescue Hub, a Best Before Cafe in Letchworth. We have Letchworth, Hitchin and Bulldog Trussell Trust Food Banks. We have an Ickleford Community Larder, one of our smaller villages. We have another village, Ashwell, providing a food pantry. And we have a Codicop Food Bank in yet another village. So North Arts District Council has, working with these groups, um, issued approximately 800 to 1,000 food parcels. Um, that was from April the 1st to June the 30th, which were, which were distributed by the local providers and which could not have happened without cooperative development and the work that was established from July 2019. And the council also established its own Healthy Hub telephone helpline, um, which takes many calls from people in food poverty, in food need, and is able to direct them to the best place um, that we know of within our food provision network group. I think it's a case study of cooperation at its finest. I think serendipity was there. Um, in as much as we began it very soon after becoming a cooperative council in, in the summer of 2019. Uh, but by goodness me, it's a good thing it was there when we really needed to develop it very quickly in March of this year. And I think I'll stop there, Sue, because I said I would say everything and I have, so I'll be quiet now. Judy, that, that's brilliant and it shows how... Uh preparation uh, for co-production really does work and I was interested in you saying that 
previously partners had been um, suspicious and protective and I think those barriers mm -hmm. all fell down at the beginning of COVID so that was very helpful. Um, Thanks, Judy. Can we move on to case study one, which is now case study two, uh, and I'll bring in Councillor Adam Farrell and Councillor Jackie Chambers from North Warwickshire. Thank you, Chairman. Would it be possible to have the first slide, please, uh, for this presentation, if that's possible? It would. Just give me a second, Jackie. Okay. Thank you. Well, whilst that's coming up, I just would like to say a few words of introduction and an apologies for coming in late to this uh, conference. Um, Councillor Adam Farrell and I are both Labour councillors in North Warwick um, and this describes one initiative that we took called the Dorden COVID-19 Click and Collect Village Shop. Um, like uh, everywhere at that time, no not, not yet please, um, I'll, I'll tell you when the next slide to come if that's okay. So during the height of lockdown um, our communities like those of everywhere were experiencing long queues at supermarkets and um, families that were eligible for free school meals were finding it difficult to use the government voucher scheme and obviously a lot of lonely elderly people were cut off and highly dependent on their families for a supply of food. So this response is one of uh, an immediate need which I'm sure everyone here has experienced and it was called the Dorden Click and Collect Village Shop. It ran just for eight weeks during the period of May and June um, and certainly wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't had mutual cooperation between ourselves and the adjoining village of Polesworth and the Labour councillors there, because they'd already established uh, a new uh, subsidised and very popular honesty food shop for their residents. And they were able to share their learning and food supply contacts with us. And Adam's going to talk a little bit just uh, at the end about what made their initiative a success and where next. So Dorden is a former mining community. Its heart is centered around the streets and homes of the former coal board estate. The uh, pit shut in 1987. The families there come from a proud tradition of being a hardworking mining community. They don't like to think of themselves as being dependent on handouts or standing in a bread line. And, and they said when we asked them about taking initiative in Dorden, they would feel uncomfortable on making and expecting to give a what you can afford donation. So can I have the next slide please then Chris, thank you. So instead of an honesty shop, next slide please, yeah. Is, after discussions, um, we came up with the idea of a click and collect food shop, which was run by a small volunteer group based at the village hall. This food shop offered a standard 10 pound bargain food box, which actually had value of about 23 pounds worth of goods in it and it was subsidised through a small councillor grant of £3,000. Residents place an order for the box about five days beforehand through Facebook Messenger or on the phone, that was the click part, and then they were allocated time slots to pick up their boxes on a Sunday morning. And this slide here shows the delivery, the box packing on a Saturday and the labelling and then taking the boxes out to the car park to be allocated. We promoted it through Facebook, through flyers, through posters, and obviously the village itself did it through word of mouth. Next slide, please. So what did we achieve? Um, well, every week about 100 boxes were ordered and went out. That in total over the eight weeks, that was 780 boxes. Each week, different households took up the scheme. They reached one in four homes in total in the village. And we knew from the street analysis that we did and local intelligence that they were ordered by many of our low income families, single adults living alone, and the elderly who weren't on the shielding list. Around one in three of these boxes were ordered and collected for other people. And we found that everybody played fair. In, in, you know, the residents arrived as scheduled to collect their boxes from the village hall, and there were no delayed payments. So we are illustrating this as an example of mutual aid which is undertaken not just by a group of active volunteers for others, but also informally by local people helping uh, for, and cooperating and supporting each other. Now the next slide, please. So in the context of today, then I'd just like to make a few points before handing over to Adam. We adapted our approach um, by consulting with some of our local residents uh, we knew what the culture and expectations of this former mining community were and we changed the model of this food uh, shop uh, to meet those, those expectations. 
the partnerships and support from po other Polesworth councillors, drawing on their experience and using their already established links with food suppliers was a key factor. And it meant that we, it was possible to get this initiative underway very quickly. And although this initiative is not an example of a sustainable one, I think it also illustrates how you can build community resilience during a crisis and provides one example of how to mobilize mutual aid, self-help and cooperation right across and from within the local community. Its importance is that it was informal mutual aid that helped make it a success by neighbors, friends, family members who all came and, and helped and took part in delivering the, the food boxes. Um, and it was an approach, as I said, which didn't just depend on a group of active volunteers to, <clears throat> to make it happen, but uh, on doing things for each other. So I'll finish there. Last, last slide, please, um, on, on the last two points, which were on grants and taking political risks for Adam to pick this one up. Thank you. Brilliant. Cheers, Jackie. Um, yeah, I'm not going to talk very long um, because this was about Dorden, um, but as Jackie said, uh, in the neighbouring village of Polesworth, which is where I'm a councillor, um, we established something fairly quickly. So we've now been operational for 27 weeks. We've just had another food uh, honesty shop on uh, Sunday just gone. Uh, and over the 27 weeks, we've supported just under 7,000 residents. Uh, we've distributed over a quarter of a million uh, food items. Uh, and it's cost us about uh, £30,000 so far. And that's what I want to talk about, um, which is essentially we were quite lucky in North Warwickshire that our council had established a one-off uh, community grant fund um, as part of the previous year's election uh, campaign. So we were quite lucky that that money was delegated to local ward councillors, something which we hadn't had on this scale ever before. So we were given uh, £17,500 per ward. There are two wards in Polesworth. So we had over £35,000 and essentially when COVID hit, the council said, spend it as you want. And I, I've been a, a borough councillor for five years now. That never happens. Officers never say, spend it how you want. What they do often say is, here's the form, here's the guidance, this is the criteria, this is the value for money we're looking for. And what I think we've learned from all of this is that communities can come together, adapt and deliver services when they do it from the bottom up. When things are designed by council officers and councillors sitting in a room away from communities, it doesn't necessarily work and it won't result in the same outcome. Um, when you think about Polesworth, it's spent about £30,000, uh, but it's actually fed 7,000 people. It's distributed a quarter of a million food items it's delivered more food items than the official Borough Council Shielding Hub did throughout its whole operation. Now, I can guarantee you that food hub operation that was run through the Borough Council and the government cost more than £30,000 to deliver. So I think one of the key learning points from this is when, as councils, we delegate money and power down to communities to enable them to deliver services. And you have to remember in Poles of Andorden, both of these communities were not organized groups. These were not already existing charities with uh, resources or anything, but they have become, they have become that essentially in Polesworth. We now have a committee that is up and running, 70 volunteers, a management committee meets twice a month on Zoom. They've done other events, mother and baby events, young parent events. So these can be really, if you take that political risk by saying we're not going to be in control of everything, you can deliver uh, an awful lot for very little money um, by enabling cooperation. So I think that was what I wanted to get across is that you can deliver change and it doesn't have to be uh, top down often. It's much better when it's delivered bottom up. Cheers, Sue. Thank you very much, Adam, and thank you, Jackie. Um, that, that is inspirational for a lot of us. And, uh, you know, it, it's interesting that Jackie's presentation referred to this, um, the grant funding being a real catalyst for change. And, and Adam, you have explained exactly how we get value for money by working alongside communities and doing things with communities rather than doing things to communities, which um, councils too often want to tend to, uh, to do. But thank you very much for that. And 
Uh, just a reminder to everyone, please, if you want to put questions in the chat box, that would be great. Um, can we go to our third case study, please? And that's Susie Finlayson uh, from Power to Change. Over to you, Susie. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of slides. I can't remember who's doing them. Rob, is it you? Can somebody pop the slides up? Um, so I'm Susie from Power to Change. While we're getting those up, I can you see those them. okay? They've not come up as though it's a slideshow. You can see the top of the screen. Perfect, thank you. Um, so if people don't know, Power to Change is a national organisation supporting community businesses. Um, we can jump to the next slide, Rob, thank you. Um, so what we describe community businesses as are they're locally rooted and accountable. And when we say local in urban areas, it tends to be kind of neighbourhood level in more rural areas. Inevitably, it's over a larger geographic space. Um, they trade in some way, so they'll sell goods and or services, normally a combination of both. Um, and they have kind of what we describe as broad community impact. So they're kind of open to everyone in the community. They might deliver services to certain parts of that community that are targeted to certain parts of the community, but overall, they're, they're kind of broadly open to everyone in the community. And I think the accountability to that local community is one of the really crucial things. So it could be everything from kind of deep community engagement through to communities having an actual kind of ownership through a community share offer where people from the local community can buy a share. Um, so that is broadly what we class community businesses as. They can be many, many different things. We've supported uh, an, a lobster hatchery in the northeast. Um, more common examples are when a local pub might be closing down. This normally happens in rural areas. There are some urban examples and the local community gather around. They buy the pub and they run it for community benefit, but they also deliver other things out of the pub. So it becomes much more than a pub. It might have post office and shop and all sorts of other things in it. Um, and a lot of them are kind of community hubs as well, but there's a whole range of different things they can be. Uh, we can jump to the next slide. So what we found across the board um, during COVID is that community businesses have, have really stepped up in their role in their communities. Um, what they've often acted at is the hubs in between the mutual aid organisations at a much more kind of couple of streets basis and the local authority or the local council in terms of holding some of that larger level local local activity. Rob, could we go to the next slide, please? Um, so yeah, so we've, and I'll give a couple of real examples of community businesses doing this, but we, we did a bit of kind of early stage research that came out, I think in July, um, about community spirit and how we can sustain that beyond beyond this current point because what we've experienced is that mutual aid groups really work best at that kind of micro micro level a couple of streets um at, at one village um obviously that's not necessarily the same across the board but that's what we've found but that at scale for all of those individual mutual aid groups to really succeed there needs to be some level of kind of organizing in the community from our experience community businesses have served as that role other organizations definitely have as well um, and that's partly because of, of the cooperative principles that underpin a lot of those community businesses in terms of the accountability and that they are really, I think, as you said, Adam, kind of they're really driven from the bottom up. So they've really already got those connections into the community. Um, and what we found is that councils have quite often worked through those community businesses because they know they can't manage everything, but they know these community organisations are there and have those relationships already. Um, some places need a bit more support. I think really interesting you talk about the grants um, that you've had, had Adam and Jackie, and I think that where those kinds of grant funds have been available, it really has helped to help to kind of accelerate the response, although I think across the board there has been kind of community spirit everywhere. Um, one of the other things, and I'd be really interested to hear from, from councillors on the call about whether they've experienced this in their places, is that community businesses and organisations broadly have really shifted what they do very quickly so um for instance there's a pub called the bevy in brighton which is on an estate in brighton um, and obviously it had to close at the start of lockdown and what it did was it shifted its model completely and set up a meals on wheels service and just started delivering food out to people on the estate and the neighboring estates to ensure that food was hot fresh food was getting out to local people who might be isolating or might be unable to get to the shops for any other reason and um, so just really flipping their models and again it's because they're already rooted in their communities 
um, a lot of them have also been able to support those new groups that you described as setting up those organizations well not organizations but those individuals who are coming together because they already exist and they have some of that infrastructure when you get groups of local people going oh we want to do this we want to support they can provide some of that kind of infrastructural support at a slightly higher level um, and i think kind of it what we've found is it does need resourcing in some way volunteers are fantastic and there's been kind of a, a huge range of volunteers coming up through covid19 and really supporting mutual aid groups delivering a lot of support on the ground um, and i think particularly as we see kind of second waves coming through and additional local lockdowns there needs to be some resourcing to enable that to happen at the scale that it is continuing to be needed at um, and for that to be able to change over time. And I think that's, that's a challenge and I don't think I have the answer for how it can be resourced, but I think there needs to be some kind of resourcing going into those communities. Um, and one of the other things we found is that where community businesses and community organisations are supporting those mutual aid organizations and, and kind of networks in their local area being able to connect them to each other has really helped so some of that kind of peer support where you can share and i think kind of adam and jackie it's really interesting the way you talked about actually the the setup you had adam wasn't quite the right setup for the other village because actually the honesty setup wasn't quite the right one but we'd set up something similar and we click and collect but without that knowledge and that sharing of knowledge between different places everyone would be starting to try and set up from scratch and i think that kind of the power of peer kind of peer support or just connections and relationships between different groups of individuals and, and organizations has been has really kind of shone through and i think where where we've seen really positive local responses and i think that's happened across the board has been councils have really gone okay how can we support people to do this and then fill in the gaps where kind of local communities can't whereas i think sometimes traditionally it's been what do we deliver as the council and where can communities fit around that and it feels like kind of the necessity of the situation has really really shifted some of those relationships um yeah so i think kind of i, I thought that that kind of judy and, and adam and jackie would give examples of individual things on the ground and i could have talked about a number of different community businesses doing its things but I think in terms of the, the future, it, it's those connections and understanding how we can build on that wave of support without, I guess, without creating burnout in individuals as well. Thank you. Thanks, Susie, that was really helpful. And, uh, you know, three case studies which encapsulate in very different ways exactly what we're part of the uh, cooperative movement for. Uh, a couple of specific questions have come up and I just wonder whether we can take those uh, first of all <clears throat> but you know the, uh, the, the what we want to do is make sure that we're doing what we said on the tin and look into the future for mutual aid groups but just reflecting back on the three case studies there's a question for Judy um, on the the value of the council's involvement in um, facilitating and supporting the food network and I just wondered whether Judy you can just comment on you know what was the role of the council specifically in supporting that and then a question for Susie about overcoming some of the barriers in terms of developing community businesses. What were the most challenging barriers uh, to overcome? So Judy first and then Susie, please. Yeah, I think what we saw was the value of a solid, dependable and historically viable community engagement team, which means that our community engagement workers have an overview um, they do things in in various ways with safeguarding with food provision with all sorts of things without being a provider specifically themselves so they are able to bring together the groups in the community without actually being a threat to any of them in order to facilitate encourage and wrap their arms around, if you're allowed to wrap your arms around anybody anymore, um, the, the, the efforts that are being made in the community. And I think that's where um, local government can shine, does shine, 
um, despite how maligned it often is, um, in, in facilitating and enabling rather than always being the provider. Because people will never be entirely excited about organisations um, that take money off you um, or, or take you to court, that have the power to empty your bins or forget to empty your bins and have the power to take your children away from you. So a local council is not in itself a warm, fluffy, loving and loved provider in the communities that they serve and we need to recognise that. But what it can do, as I say, is enable those organisations doing magnificent voluntary work um, by acting as a mediator, a referee um, and a place for people to share. Um, I think over to me. Um, thank you, Gareth. I think in terms of challenges, um, some of the major challenges community businesses faced were a kind of very steep decline in their income, because as I said at the beginning, a lot of them trade, so they're not just grant reliant, they do get grants for, for various different things, but a lot of them generate a lot of income through trading, and that'll be through delivering services, having a cafe on site, or whatever it might be. And obviously those things stopped immediately, so they saw a massive in decrease in the income they were generating, but at the same time a huge increase in the demand on their support. Um, so whilst kind of, I guess, more traditional businesses could really take advantage of the furlough schemes, a lot of community businesses didn't, that wasn't the right decision for them because they needed to keep supporting their communities, but their income was decreasing. So I think that was one of the major things that was a challenge, particularly initially. Um, Additionally, some of them, because they can have any number of different legal structures, some of them, because of their legal structure and a balance of charitable status, weren't eligible initially for some of the core government support. So that just caused some problems um, right at the start. Um, I think when, when kind of grants, new grant schemes, we, we delivered them, but obviously so did loads of other people, started to become available that helped to plug some of those gaps for them so that they could keep delivering services, keep staff on board. Um, although it's going to be an ongoing challenge around kind of employment and, and maintaining staff teams at the size they were. I think where it's worked really well is where councils have really done that kind of facilitative role. They've really been supportive and not just financially, but also in terms of their kind of logistically and understanding the local system and how and where community businesses and communities can thrive within that and being able to open doors for them and build connections for them and it's become much more in a kind of partnership um, as opposed to kind of a, a provider relationship um, it's it's different everywhere I think you'll all have different examples of it but it's it's where it's that real relationship and partnership and the value of communities and community organizations has really come to the fore and been totally recognized I think that's where it's been a really strong response You're muted, Sue. Oh my goodness me, I did it, I did it and I didn't intend to, sorry about that. But thank you for those responses and thanks to Gareth Wall for posing those questions. I'm conscious too that Nigel Todd has uh, uh, said how helpful uh, uh, Jackie and Adam's presentation was on, the, uh, on their food shop. Um, he refers to local flexibility being the key there uh, and I'm conscious too that you know we we all admire what's been going on in communities that the three case studies show but as we're among friends here I wonder if any of you could say you know what difficulties you faced it so I'll go to Adam and Jackie first but what difficulties did you face and what did you learn in a sense from uh, setting up your uh, various schemes that perhaps you would pass on to us so that we avoid those pitfalls in the future. Shall I start with Adam and Jackie? Yeah, does Jackie want to cover this? Because uh, yeah. Paul's most wonderful, so Jordan has more for uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I think the points that have been made about having a foundation on which to build and knowing your community as a councillor are absolutely key to making something a success and certainly um, you know, spotting in knowing who those people are in your village that are going to prepare, be prepared to step forward and take things forward. And we didn't have the support of officers, actually, or a community development team to, to do what we did. It was, it was a very organic process of 
of, of actually communicating with the people that we knew had done volunteering and made efforts in the past. So, uh, and they, one of the group that actually did the ordering had a bank account. Um, and that was probably in terms of getting things moving, having a, a constituted group of some sort that has a bank account that you can put um, grants through is, is quite an important thing and it takes a long time. So some very practical things like that. I think the challenges are that we had to negotiate with the parish council for use of the village hall. They were quite protective about that in terms of you know infection cross infection didn't want this empty village hall that was unused at first to be to be used but we got the you know because the other borough council was chairman of the parish council we managed to get through all of that so there you know you have to play the politics don't you of the game and uh, and some of those your in-house politics of, of labor colleagues and uh, and so on are, are part of that so i think that's the main thing um and and the last challenge i will mention is that Although you have a, a commitment to equity of access, the routes that you choose, initially we did it for families through Facebook and flyers, uh, which went out there. Still, even at the end of eight weeks, there were people just beginning to understand that this scheme had, was, was out there and could be accessed uh, by ringing up certain numbers. So there are certain people there that, you know, however hard you try, you still got to, you know, have uh, uh, routes for reaching them that, that are much more direct um, than the traditional routes by which we promote initiatives such as this. Smashing, thanks Jackie. Judy, do you want to comment on any yeah, difficulties you faced? Yeah, it's difficult because um, it is presumptuous of me to talk about the learning that's, that's taken place amongst the community development team who, if I'm honest, did the heavy lifting in the project that I've described. Um, so I'll speak for them without even having consulted them, which is a really, really bad thing to do. Um, and since um, uh, one of the uh, leading officers in the area and the um, leader of the council are on this call, they will reprimand me severely afterwards. I think maybe what one of the things that has been learned is that the spirit of community development is very much uh, a non-directive activity, sport, hobby um, thing to be done. I, I was almost going to use the word fluffy again, but I mustn't because I've already done that. So I think maybe one of the bits of learning has been when you need to be directive in order to make something work, as well as um, being popular and liked and uh, applauded by everybody in the community. Now that is a message for councillors as well uh, and is a very very difficult one in times of deeply critical social media that we're all facing um, but I, I would think that would be one of the bits of learning but as I say there there are others on the call Ruben Ayavu is with us um, who could probably answer that question better than I could thanks Judy are you trying to say that councillors don't know everything I realised there was a small risk in what I said, yes. <laughs> um, Adam wanted to just come in on, on a point on community development. Adam? Yeah, cheers Sue. Um, it's really following on from what, what Judy said about how um, great they are uh, in terms of the community development team in North Hearts, but I think that's brilliant when you have a great community development team and it, clearly there's been a lot of work done under many different political administrations there to get that to get it right, um, as Judy said earlier. But I think in North Warwickshire, one of our challenges, and I know it frustrates the life out of me, Jackie, and, and Labour and co-op colleagues, is that <clears throat> our community development team under both administrations that has run the council over many years, just lacks a bit of drive and energy and you know vision for, for what the community could do um, and how it could empower the community. And it sort of turned into, you know, the, 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 the latest community development is we'll put on a few events each year um, and we'll do it ourselves and we'll ask local community groups to book on a little stall, which is not community development. That isn't really what has happened. So I think maybe one of the learning points from, from COVID-19 and from some of the stuff we've talked about today is how we can take back to our councils, whether we're in opposition or control, um, but also through the parishes, and obviously that's a growing part of CCIN, um, is how do you adapt community development at a time of austerity and they're going to be the first to be hit in the next round of cuts no doubt um, 
to look and feel more like North Hearts and less like North Warwickshire. And perhaps it's looking at the best of community development in the councils that are part of the network and trying to bring up the rest to, to a decent standard. Because Jackie's right, in North Warwickshire, we didn't get any offices. All of this was done organically and more has been done in the last six months in terms of community development, I think from the benefits of COVID, if there are any, um, than in the previous six years of community development. So I just thought I'd chip that in as maybe a key learning point for, for the future. Thanks, Adam. That's really helpful. And Susie, do you want to comment? You've mentioned some of the barriers, but do you want to comment on some of those difficulties that you've learned from and wouldn't replicate? Um, I, think, I think one of the overall reflections is remembering and we're a national organization but remembering every kind of it, we all know this but really remembering every community is very different um, and if we're genuinely going to kind of support and enable bottom-up development of responses to those communities we've got to take that kind of flexibility of approach but it, it needs it needs investing in as i said before it's not just it's not just money obviously some money helps but it's about how you how you provide kind of resource um, and people resource and skills and support into those communities and those kind of groups of individuals as they're forming if they want to go down the kind of setting up a formal charitable organization or co-op um, how do you support them to do that what is the other stuff that you can do to enable them to get to that point that isn't necessarily just financial but financial support is is important and i think there are there are quite a few different routes to that financial support so i think the onus doesn't always need to fall on the councils which obviously um, the kind of budget austerity and, and reducing budgets it's not gonna not gonna be a lot of money around to be supporting that but if local groups do want to move into a kind of more formal organized um space there are routes of support for that available so i think it's about being able to provide them with information as much as with the direct support okay, okay thanks susie I i'm conscious of time and i've been told that we can extend the the session and discussion to, uh, till 10 past 12 though i'm also conscious of the fact that people will want to replenish their coffee cups and perhaps have a comfort break as well but we have got until 12 10 and we're sort of moving on to what the session's about what can we do for the future to support mutual aid groups and jackie certainly made a very practical point that these groups need bank accounts and constitutions and so on to enable them um to um to bid for grants that, that you know can, can take them forward uh, gareth has also uh, referred to you know how do you keep on trying to reach those harder to reach groups particularly those who aren't digitally enabled so i wonder if anyone either um you know our panel or anyone who's uh, part of the audience if, if you want to make some comments on some steps now to go forward and how we capture all of this wonderful work that mutual aid groups have been doing to go forward so, Anyone? I'll just check chat. Yeah, I don't mind chipping in again. Um, Off you go, Adam. On this. I wonder whether actually it's something that the network wants to think about, like I just said about community development and how we take the very best of what uh, full member councils are doing um, in terms of supporting mutual aid and uh, sort of cooperative development. And we, we could almost develop a sort of good practice guide not about what has been done because i think we've, we've learned today that in every community the service you deliver the model that you use will be slightly different but the route that you use to get there might have some similarities um, and part of that is about flexibility and freedom and um, devolving power and cooperation and removing structures and barriers um, but we could almost look at how you could reduce a good practice guide for that and sort of sort of shape councils thinking as we go through the next round of austerity because you know those sorts of areas are going to be the, the first ones officers present to to members to cut because they're not statutory services and therefore if the government don't um, fully fund councils which i can't imagine they will ever do um with the current government in place then we you know we have to get to a point where how can we make the savings we need to a member councils, four member councils will need to make those savings to balance the books and still deliver a decent, worthwhile community development, cooperative development service. 
Thanks, Adam. Uh, Nigel's referred to the need for that sort of collective memory of what we've done. Uh, and certainly the CCIN is a really helpful network to enable that to happen. And I'll just remind uh, colleagues today that the launch at the beginning of the plenary session of the cooperation through COVID-19, I think that sort of collects, if you like, what's happened in the past six months and now we need to make sure that we're capturing the learning to go uh, forward. Uh, Ruben talked about empowerment in the chat, empowerment of these community groups and that takes what um, uh, what Tom Hayes said this morning, that political bravery. It's very, very difficult for politicians at any level, parish council, district council, county council, government, to actually let go of the reins and say, here you are communities, this is for you, you work out how you're going to do it yourself. And Rob, uh, again in chat, has made the point that we mustn't go back to that sort of risk aversion and holding everything centrally, whether the centre is a parish council or county council or whatever. Uh, and I just wondered in the few minutes that we've got left before you all um, vote with your feet and leave, whether Rob, Gregory, whether you want to sort of pull some of these threads together and, and uh, make your comments. Thank, thanks, Sue, and thanks everyone for the, the, the contributions. I think, you know, what, what's come out quite, quite clearly in the, in the chat is about this kind of evolving role of, of councils um, in the pan pandemic and how, um, yes, there was very much that, that initial response, uh, but that response where it's been most effective has been about the way that councils and councillors counselor, have um, worked in a facilitative, um, a cooperative way um, working with people opposed to uh, that traditional council approach um, which you know might be about council plowing in providing a service doing something but actually it's been far more uh, collaborative around that and I think um, what's come out quite clearly from the North Hearts examples and the North Warwickshire example has has just been about the brokerage role uh, that particularly elected members have played but also uh, the officers and the skill set for officers and I think talking as a council officer it is about building a new breed of, of council officer which has that skill set which is far more collaborative it isn't that computer says no type uh, culture it's about how can we uh, facilitate and support this and it might not be about us controlling it and I think uh, Susie's points about how we resource this is really important um, so I think, you know, what, what's come out quite clearly is this was all based on goodwill and uh, the resources that we were able to pull together. But facilitation does need some resourcing as well. Um, and it's about how we how we do that going forward um, and how we build that future, which isn't just about um, uh, responding to this crisis. It's about the kind of uh, the future that we want in terms of those of us who are involved in kind of public service and um, um, on working with communities. Um, so I, I, it's been really helpful. And I think we'll type up some some uh, key kind of uh, comments that have come from uh, this session, because I think, as Sue said, it's going to be really helpful for the CCIN moving forward um, as, as, as we continue to, to build this uh, kind of uh, uh, body of uh, experience and good practice. Thanks, Rob. Um, I've been told that both Jackie and Judy wanted to just jump in following Adam, Adam's comment. So, Jackie, do you want to go first and then I'll leave the last word to Judy because um, she perhaps won't speak to me if I don't. Uh, so, Jackie, just... No, I, I, I don't know. I think that was an excellent uh, summing up that, and Rob that, that you gave us and I'd like to leave on that kind of high note that you just... Great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Judy, you have the last word. Well, apart from the chair, of course. Oh, Marvellous. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, and two um, uh, sort of jolly comments from me, I suppose. First of all, I think the idea that, that Adam put forward of us working together to learn from some of the work on community engagement and development um, that's been going on and could be shared uh, would be brilliant and I'd be more than happy to take part in that because I've been quite keen on that area for quite a long time now. Um, and the other po point I wanted to make, I suppose I'm having a bit of a Millie Molly Mandy moment really, um, is in answer to Rob about how we remember the agility um, of the last few months and that's a really important point 
but I think that the level of agility shocked us all so much and what we were able to do and what we could achieve that we didn't even know existed um, that it will take a very long time for those lessons to leave me and I don't think I'm unique in that and I think we have all learnt, if nothing else, how to do things quickly and keep the momentum once we've established them. So I'm quite optimistic about that. And there have to have been some good things that have come out of this dreadful few months. And they are some of them, I think. Thanks, Sue. But you get the last word. Yes, I do. So uh, <laughs> then I just want to say thank you to everyone who's contributed this morning, the people who've asked questions, the people who've uh, given us our presentations and, uh, and those who've been there listening. Um, the conversation continues, that's for sure, uh, certainly around mutual aid groups and you know, the contact details for everyone uh, are available through CCIN. So, you know, end on a positive note. Yes, there are real um, positive points to take out of that dreadful situation of COVID. And hopefully the CCIN can be um, the catalyst in the centre of all that. So thank you very much. Enjoy your fringe meetings or enjoy your coffee, enjoy your lunch, and uh, we'll catch up again very soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>